Hi guys, good morning. I'm Mallory Davis, the Business and Marketing Manager for Scale Up Milwaukee. We're excited to have everyone here again. We miss all of you in person, but really excited to feature our first Meet the Masters virtually with Jennifer Bartolotta. Um, we're so excited to have her. Um, really excited to have you guys here. Some of the new ventures that she's been a part of, um, and as always, having Elmer moderate. Uh, just a quick announcement, we did launch our Spark applications for cohort four. Uh, so if you or a business owner that you know is a black, Latinx, or woman-owned business, uh, we do have those applications up and running and you can get more information on our website, scaleupmilwaukee.org. Or you can reach out to Elizabeth, our program manager that runs all of our accelerators, Elizabeth at sumke.com. So with that, I will turn it over to Elmer. He turned off everything that makes noise. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did. I was a little too effective in quieting the entire room. So let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. We are very excited to present this guest, but we're also excited to start uh, what is going to be a, a new version of this ongoing program called Meet the Masters. Normally, we would be in an intimate setting together. We would have a conversation amongst a large group of friends. Um, but today, we're going to do it a little differently. So Jennifer and I are going to have something of a face-to-face, -face, and we're going to be looking, we're going to be doing our best to look for your contributions, questions, comments, reactions, and so on in the Q&A uh, down below. And there's a chat. So feel free to use either one. We'll be watching. Um, just to give this a test, I want anyone who is drinking something this morning to write what they're drinking in the chat window. Thank you for not writing alcoholic beverages. That's, that would not be appropriate. So we're going to assume, oh, oh, wow, Jennifer, that, that's, that's very classy. Okay, good. Well, we understand that the chat works. Oh, and we've got someone else. Okay, we've got, thank you, Andy, for noting the chat is disabled. So actually, we will just use the Q&A. All right, so let's... Let's get this conversation cracking. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Elmer. You know, I'm excited for this conversation because we knew from our, our just very, very short prep call that we were committed to making this conversation very different from everyone we've ever had in a Meet the Masters. And so I'm expecting it's going to get a little weird, a little wild, a little deep. Are you ready for it? Let's go. So let's start at the most obvious thing. Um, folks associate your name, the last name, with uh, one of the most important institutions in our community. And that, of course, is the Bartolotta restaurants. And we've associated you with those restaurants for so many years. And for various reasons, some of them more challenging than others, you have, you've worked very hard to reposition yourself as a resource for the community in a very different way. And I'm excited to hear you talk about that because right now everyone is forced to re-identify how they want to contribute to our community because of the pandemic, because of our nation's awakening to racial injustice and so on. So I want you to talk to us about why and how you made a transition from someone that we all knew as Jennifer Bartolotta, restaurateur, uh, business executive, and, and spouse to Joe, into Jennifer Bartolotta, managing partner of uh, place-based development, founder and executive for Train to Gain, your other business, and oh, by the way, founder and executive for Bartolotta and Associates. Sure. Um, 
I'll t I'll t let's go back just a little bit. When I first moved to Milwaukee, um, the things that people of color suffered for a long time were very apparent to me. Um, my dad was an in international business. My parents in 60 years of marriage have shared over 35 addresses. And I, part of my upbringing was in Puerto Rico. I, from fifth through eighth grade, I lived in San Juan, Puerto Rico, which was a melting pot of the world at the time. I lived in a building with Saudis and Russians and people from France and all over. And so when I moved to Milwaukee 20 years ago, almost, it was, I was really disturbed at what we're challenged by. And I decided, when Joe and I decided to get married and I moved from Chicago to Milwaukee, I decided that I wanted to um, use my resources and uh, the companies because Joe was very supportive of, of the desire to want to give back in a bigger way than just give gift certificates. But he really didn't have the capacity. He was involved in business things. And he didn't, I mean, he gave a lot through gift certificates, but he didn't have the capacity to give to nonprofits. And so my very first entree was with Made a House. And I started to learn about people and I started to learn about um, their journeys and their struggles and their challenges in this city. And that, that entree informed a lot of the philanthropy that Joe and I did with a company. But along the way, those inequities sat with me. And as I began to use my voice and I started my company Train to Gain, I started to see that you could, if you looked at people carefully, you could see what was going on by what they did with their body. And I got this curiosity around how we communicate. And um, then the reality came that I now call it Joe's Great Escape. Um, I'm not in denial. I know he's not here. I know that he died. But given the world that we live in today, I call it his great escape because it, this would have been a very challenging time for him. So that happened. And what was in place at the time was an agreement that um, his brother had rights of first refusal, essentially, to purchase all of Joe's shares of the company. And that was something that was in place. And Paul wanted to exercise that agreement. And so he did. So on February 26th of this year, I signed paperwork, which formally removed me in all capacities from the company. Um, and it is 100% Paul's company. I am no longer involved in any capacity other than I have this 20 years of history in Milwaukee with the company, right? So it's always the elephant in the room for a lot of people. Well, is she involved? Is she not involved? Should I call her if they're not calling me back or if I want to know when Harbor House is opening, right? And so there's a little bit of stickiness there and awkwardness, I think, not just for me, but for people who want to know about the restaurants and who are curious, because as you said, Joe built this behemoth of a brand locally. Um, so February 26th, that happened. Um, March 17th was the last day that I ventured outside before the lockdown. And I started to think about what I was going to do to um, evolve with what was happening. And I had this interest in people and how we communicate and the, and the burden that we carry. You know, people, we have a tremendous capacity of human beings to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders like an iceberg, but yet go out into public. But sometimes we get pushed and we do things or say things that are uncharacteristic, that might be incongruent with who we normally are, that might confuse people we're engaged with, or more, or at the far end of that extreme, might even be considered outlying behavior, right? And so I heard about St. A and their trauma-informed care with some work that I was doing with Running Rebels, which was a, a nonprofit that we adopted for a year. And then I saw Oprah came to Milwaukee and did the segment on Running Rebels. I'm not about Running Rebels, about St. A um, for 60 minutes. And it just like popped into my head one day and I thought, I'm going to get a certification in trauma-informed care while I'm, you know, trying to figure out where I'm going to head. At least I'll have that and I'll figure out how I'm going to weave that into what I train. And then when COVID happened, I reached out. Um, and had this conversation with Sadie. I said, I see you have a class coming. I want to take it. And I have this, I have this suspicion that COVID is going to be a mental health equalizer for everybody. And in, fact, in that it's going to be, uh, it's going to be devastating to everyone. No one will escape yeah. having wandered through COVID. Yep. So whether you're the CEO of a Fortune 50 company and you had to lay off thousands of people, 
whether you were one of those people who got laid off, if you're still employed, if you're a healthcare worker, if you're what's considered our essential workers and you're going, you have to, you took the bus to get to the grocery store that you work at. Now the buses aren't work, but you need your job and, and the job is there for you, but you got to figure that everybody was affected by it. Right? So if you take what we had already, which was a little bit of anxiety, you know, I mean, we just did, we live in a time where things are a little challenging, have a little bit of anxiety. And then you plop this whole COVID thing on top of what we were already wrestling with as a population. I just sensed that people were going to be affected by it and that I might be able to help. So I got the certification from St. A and I've been working with them very closely on developing content that absolutely respects the tenets of trauma-informed care. But the reality of that training, Elmer, is that in my class, when I took my certification out of 11 people, I believe I was the only non-PhD. Mm-hmm. Trauma-informed care is dense neuroscience. That said, there are pieces of it that if we can make them relatable and palatable and digestible to the common person, then they can be deployable. So what I've worked with St. A to do is to, to pull out these pieces so that we can understand what's happening to us physiologically when we get poked and we start to do things that are confusing to the audiences and then how we can regulate. More importantly, for leaders of companies, though, this creates a common language and a level of EQ within a company that wasn't there before. But the reality is, is nobody is working right now and no one's going to go back to work the way they left. Mm -hmm. We are all carrying things, huge things, just beneath our surface. We're bobbing on the water, our heads up there, we're showing up, but we're not the same. And... If we can create an environment at work where we can support that reality by a quick check-in every day, and there's a common language around that every day, we will have a healthier and more stable workforce that feels like we see them and we hear them and we're doing the best that we can as leaders to manage with them as opposed to against what we can't see that's beneath the surface. So this is, this is too easy a question uh, or too simple a question, but as the, as this conversation started, what would have been the better way for us to uh, say good morning to one another? Good morning, Jennifer. How are you is, is insufficient. What should I have asked you instead that, that uh, accomplishes at least a little bit of the goals that you just described? I actually think if we had a common language, how are you is not a bad question, Amar. When Joe first made his great escape, people would say, well, how are you? And that's just such a natural human interaction. You know, I hug, right? We shake hands, we look in the eyes. It's a natural question. I just think we lack the vocabulary to go from that point. So what I started to do when people asked me that question right after Joe left, they would say, how are you? And I said, I said to myself, I don't want to make somebody feel bad for asking me such a natural question. So I came up with a scale. And every morning when I woke up, I laid in bed and I said, Where, how are you today, Jen? On a scale from one to 10, how are you today? And then that would be my number. And of course, across the day, that number could, could shift, right? But I would say, I'm an eight or I'm a five. I'm here right? I'm here. So the way that this works within a company would be as simple as red, yellow, green. So imagine if you went to work tomorrow and Julia sent out an email and said, how's everybody today? And you just type in red, yellow, or green, right? Then Julia can look at the aggregate of that and say, let's say she needs to put out a policy change, but it's not timely. It doesn't have to happen today. So she looks at her mass and the aggregate of these colors and she sees, ooh, I'm tilting more red yellow than I am yellow green today. So that email about policy change, which we all know change creates more anxiety for people, right? She could say, look, you know what? I'm gonna wait a day or two until my balance is more yellow green than it is yellow red. So red is I'm here, I'm here. 
and I'm going to give you all I got, but that's the best I got today. You know, yellow is I'm here. I'm reasonably good. Yellow could mean maybe I didn't get enough sleep last night. I had two glasses of wine instead of one. My two year old woke up, woke up at two o'clock in the morning. I've been up since then. I'm tired, but I'm here and I'm good. Right. And green is I, I did all the things that I need to do to support myself so I can show up and give you my best today. And I'm pretty good. And it really can be that simple, right? What we lack as human beings is the vocabulary, the common connection, what connects us together so that we can, when we have these conversations, we can be more transparent about where we are. Uh, so let's try this. Um, okay. I think Mallory changed to so the chat is now open. Okay. So I'm gonna invite everyone to, to, their, to their comfort to answer, how are you? Actually, let's, let's, uh, let's use the, I'm, I'm reading, uh, Crystal, how can you ensure that the answers from the red, yellow, green exercise are genuine and concerned? So I'm gonna take a stab at answering that. Uh, and I'm gonna ask, instead of using the chat, we're gonna use the Q&A because I think the Q&A is visible only to uh, Jen and I. So in the Q&A, is that accurate? Can you all see the Q&A? I can. can. But can they see each other's cues? <laughs> that I don't know. Uh, yes. yes. Yes, they can. OK, well, using the chat or the q and I'm going to ask everyone, um, how are you red, yellow, green? Um, and Jen, I'm going to invite you to answer Crystal's question, which is, how can you ensure that the answers are, are genuine? Um, you can't. Uh, the, I'll start off by saying I'm a green. So let me tell you how I got to green today. Um, I spent all day yesterday at St. Luke's with my dad in a series of appointments. I picked him up at 930. I dropped him off at almost five o'clock last night. Um, I had a lot of anxiety about being in that environment, about protecting my 83-year-old dad, who definitely is in the vulnerable category. And then because I've moved recently, I had to go vote. So I had all this, I had a really big day yesterday and I was really looking forward to today. So I did everything all day yesterday and last night and this morning that I know I needed to do to support myself mentally and physically and spiritually. I got up at five o'clock, I worked out, I meditated, I did all my normal stuff, right? I ate well, I got a good night's sleep. And I was super excited to be here. So legitimately, I'm a green. Now, how do you know whether or not people are using those to be honest? You don't. We can only rely on how willing you are to be vulnerable in the place where we're having these conversations, right? Um, and I think if there is, the beauty of this is the training lasts about 60 minutes. And then there's a, a post conversation with the leadership team and then the employee base about how it gets deployed. And, and the, the message is, listen, the, for sure, this isn't for everybody, right? This is as touchy and feely and, you know, mushy as it gets at work. That said, we all need to be seen and heard right now. And we all have a lot going on. So, if we are willing to be vulnerable in the, in the places and spaces that we operate in, because the platform has been established for us to show up that way. Yes, it's scary. It takes courage to be vulnerable, but what happens when we're not honest about it is if we show up as a red and that policy change comes out in an email, mm and our water starts to boil, then what happens when we haven't been honest is we start to do and say things that are incongruent to who we are and how we normally show up. And that behavior, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, confuses the audience. And those, those things, as small as they are, can be catastrophic in a workplace because you could be labeled as being something that you're not, right? So had I not gotten enough sleep this morning, um, I actually, I was calm and ready. I logged on early. I came up to my desk at eight o'clock 
and I went to go online and it says, you have no internet service. <laughs> now, had I been tired, had I not worked out, had I not spent the time spiritually, that might have unnerved me, right? That simple thing might have unnerved me. And when we first got on the call at about 8.15, you might have looked at me and gone, well, she says she's okay, but she looks off. Mm -hmm. That confuses you, right? So yes, it takes courage to be vulnerable. But if in our workplaces, we can arrive at this place where we have, or even in our personal relationships, we can arrive at this place where we have this common language that says, hey, I'm a red today. I'm here, I'm going to do my best, but I, my foundation is not solid, mm. right? Then, Elmer, if you show up exhibiting body language that looks like this, and you're not making good eye contact with me, I understand that there's something behind that. I understand that you showed up carrying a burden that I can't and necessarily don't need to see, but I can have respect and I can honor that you're in that space and I cannot get all confused and have this mental dialogue about what's wrong with you if you're looking like this. Because I know so, that there's something beneath your surface. So, so uh, I've, got a, I've got a tough question for you, but first um, we've got a request to just briefly restate red, yellow, and green and how we might interpret those. Sure, okay. So I'll give you just a little bit of this, all right? Dating back to Aristotle, so about 340-ish BC, there are, there, are, there are teachings from Aristotle that said that we need to get sleep, we need to eat well, we need to exercise, we need to spend time in nature, and we need to have deep and wide connections with people that not just are pleasant, but that can be provoking, right? We need to be challenged. Our, our thoughts and our, our beliefs need to be challenged by those people that love us and hold us dear. Mm -hmm. So he started that. Then in the mid 1800s, you had another whole cohort of people who reinforced the importance of the, those five things. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, Albert Einstein, and Sigmund Freud all said, in fact, some of them only worked four hours a day meaningfully, and they spent the rest of the day doing those other things. Mm. And now you have the Harvard Divinity School studying those things. So part of being green, yellow or red, is how well you've done those five things. Did you get enough sleep? Have you taken care of your temple and, and fed it what it needs nutritionally to be able to perform? Especially when we know we're under extra stress right now, right? Are we exercising? And exercising can mean going for a walk, right? It doesn't mean you gotta, you don't have to sweat. To, you just have to move, movement. Are you spending time outside? When we spend out time outside, we are constantly reminded, you know, I don't know if anybody else paid attention, but Mother Nature had no idea that COVID was going on. The flowers still came up. Hope is outside. Mm -hmm. Hope isn't inside, hope is outside. And are you deeply and meaningfully connected? Have you done that? I spent the whole day with my 83-year-old dad yesterday. It was the best thing. As challenging as being in that environment was, I spent the time with my dad. So that's the foundation of where we are, right? You start off with this. Then, so let's say I did all that well. I drive to work. I'm good. I come into work. I'm ready to go. Yellow is maybe some of those things are off. Maybe I didn't get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. And maybe on my way into work, my trigger is disrespect. And the dude cut me off on the highway. Right now I walk in the door, I'm tired and I'm a little twerked at the, at the, who knows what we say to the guy or lady. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't, I shouldn't say guy. The, the person dude is a gender neutral pronoun. Yeah. <laughs> um, the person that cuts you off in traffic. Right. And then I walk into work and I get an email that says that there's this change that's been implemented at work. All right. I'm here. I'm going to get my job done. I'll, I'll get through it, but I'm a yellow, right? I got enough going on. Mm -hmm. Red would be, I didn't get enough sleep. Uh, maybe I didn't exercise. Maybe I haven't connected with people where I feel seen and heard. And 
a person cut me off in traffic and I walked into work and there's a policy change. I no more than did that. And my mom called and she had an accident in the extended care living place that she's in. And now my boss walks in my office. I'm a red. I'm a red. Right? I, I, there's too much going on. And I'm going to be here and I'm going to do my job, but I'm boiling underneath my surface. Mm. Right? And, and, and what we lack is the vocabulary to understand what's happening to us. And then we lack, we don't come with a manual that says, when your water starts to boil, here's how you cool it back down, right? We don't come with the manual of self-regulation to A, notice that it's happening to us, and then B, mitigate it. So, I am a man. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a few years ago, there was, actually, I think it was last year, uh, while it feels longer ago there was the Me Too movement. And um, hopefully most people who uh, present themselves to the world as men were forced to recognize the, the likelihood that we had participated in an overwhelmingly sexist agenda. Uh, not only in the way that we structure things, but also in the way that we communicate, in the way that we um, interact with with others and especially women. It was a very difficult time, and you know, most of the fortunately, most of the men in my life uh, were available for the conversation. Like, wow, it really makes you think about the things that I've done that weren't. Uh, not that we've all done something horrible, but we've done things that weren't right. For instance, I am someone. Uh, I'm a pretty. I'm a pretty green guy, I'm a pretty happy guy, and I'm not, um, I'm not far from always asking someone how they're doing and asking, hey, what's, why not smile, right? And I've come to learn that asking uh, someone about smiling is, can be triggering in the same way that uh, uh, the word articulate can be triggering for a lot of black folks. We'll, we'll get back to that. So I, I bring all that up because as we look to, as we invite everyone to pay better attention to the ways that uh, those around us and, and our, our colleagues and those in our social circles are, are presenting themselves and their, their polarities, we are also at risk of uh, not fully understanding the way folks who are unlike ourselves might be so different as to present their mood, their color very differently. For instance, body language is not absolutely universal, uh, nor is uh, eye contact or the way someone might answer that question. So to that end, I ask, uh, how, do we, how do we engage that with a sensitivity that we we shouldn't expect everyone to do what we do. Sure. Long question, I apologize for that. It's okay. Um, first of all, body language is universal. How it's interpreted is not universal, mm. right? So, and what we're saying, so what we're saying isn't universal. How it's interpreted is universal, right? So if you were to do this and put your eyes down, I'm going to think all kinds of, I'm going to think about five or six things about you it's probably not what you're saying, which is the danger in not being able to recognize what we're going through and regulate our behavior. Because how we interpret it, while the meaning behind it is never the same, we do things for very different reasons. How it gets, how it's seen, how it's perceived is more universal. Um, I think it starts with something really simple. Um, I, I think it's two things, right? I think the first is I, and, and Joe and I shared this, we believe that 99% of the population is good. We believe that 99.999% of people wake up every day and are good, decent human beings. So, 
starting with that place, then I think the next thing is something really simple. You know, I'm sure you, I, I don't know. I'm sure there were people who were very frustrated with the Me Too movement. It happened, there was a lot of attention, and then there were a lot of questions about, well, what, what, what are we supposed to do? What can we do, right? And there was this, and I know you said we'll get back to it, but since you went there, I'm gonna go there just a little bit. Then when um, we began to have greater awareness over the racial injustices, particularly with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery um, and Breonna Taylor, that happened to me. Now, I don't consider myself at all an expert, but I will tell you that I've spent 18 years in the underbelly of this city trying to understand and connect it better together. And I found myself saying, wow. I, in fact, I reached out to every friend I had of color at the time and said, I am so sorry that there was so much I didn't know and I didn't understand and that I stand in solidarity with you and I promise to create a space where you feel safer to have deep, meaningful conversations with me about what you're going through. Um, I, there's no one answer here, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's the Me Too movement or whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement. There's no one thing, but I know what I can do. And what I can do is see you and engage with you so when you, it, it was interesting that you said, you make the comment about why not a smile and that you've learned that that can be triggering because you don't know what's beneath the surface. So what I try to do is provoke a smile. I go out of my way to engage with people in public spaces and I try to provoke a smile. So as an example, last night when I went to go vote, I've moved to Bayview and I had to walk through South Shore Park to get to the pavilion where my voting, new voting place is. And there happened to be an African-American couple um, and they were grilling on charcoal, which just automatically is gonna light me up because it's food, right? I'm the girl that goes to bed thinking about breakfast. So I said, oh, wow, that smells great. I don't even know what you're making, but the guy was breaking up some branch and, his, and he was putting it on his grill and, I'm, and it smelled amazing. So I go vote and I'm coming back and now they've got music playing and she's singing and she has the most amazing voice. And so as I was walking by them again, I said, oh, you guys are so set up fat. You got the grill, you got the charcoal, you got the music and you got the voice of an angel. And she looked at me like I gave her a million bucks. Mm -hmm. She just lit up. And then she said, honey, God bless you. And we both left that moment, all three of us actually, because he had a big smile on his face. We all left that, I don't know, 90 seconds of connection better, right? Better. And I don't have all the answers. I don't know how to fix the Me Too movement. I don't know how to fix all the challenges with the Black Lives Movement matters, but I know I can do my piece, right? Um, I, and I think there's one other part of this. Well, we all have triggers. And I don't think you get out of this time space continuum that we're living in without having suffered really hurtful, traumatic things. But I do think that we are quick to react and to take things personally where we shouldn't. And I'm not gonna speak about the Black Lives Matter movement because I am not. I'm, I'm not, it's not, a, it, it's not a place that I should be talking in, but let me talk about the Me Too movement, okay? While it needed to be discussed, while the box needed to be ripped off the lid, while horrific things have happened to women, it happened to me three different times during my career when I worked for a Fortune 500 company. I do think that we don't know how to manage through these things in our lives. And that causes us to take things personally that were not intended to be an attack or to be provoking. What was so sad to me about the Me Too movement is there were guys in the ring 
advocating for women, elevating women, seeing women, helping women lift them to new positions and new places. And because the pendulum ended up swinging really far in one direction, now, now those really well-intended guys who may not have gotten it right all the time, but who would expect you to? You're a dude, right? We're different. Now all those guys who were legitimately in the ring doing that are scared. That, that sets us back. You know, this country tends to swing its pendulum way too far in both directions. And we don't even have to end up in the middle, but if we could just get closer to the middle, right? And check ourselves and say, so let's say you had an exam. All right, let me just, I don't even know if you've done this, but let's say in the, in the aftermath of Me Too, you and I were walking down a hallway and my arms were full and you ran to go open the door. And you checked yourself because of the Me Too movement. When inherently in your DNA, you're coded to want to help me. But because of this movement and what you've heard, you now think maybe you shouldn't open the door for me. And you hesitate. Maybe I, um, I'm, you know, uh, I, I, I'm going to do it all by myself and I'm super stubborn and I don't want a man who still has some chivalry left in him to open the door for me. And now I am twerked because you were trying to be nice. Mm -hmm. You were twerked. You're now confused because you're not sure if you should open the door for me anymore. Maybe I get upset because you went to open the door for me because I have this perception that you think I can't do it for myself. The female part of that equation, Elmer, come on, right? Come on, ladies. So... I, I appreciate the example and, and recognize, of course, that it is the experience of those things is is almost infinitely more complex, right? And it's it's yep. rapid cycling, and we're we're trying um, at our best. We are trying to make the best decision for the moment, and we are trying to um, interpret uh, what others choose in the best possible way. Um, and that yes, right now uh, is a particularly unsafe moment because it is very easy to mean well and be, uh, it's, it's actually, it's possible to, to mean well and be correctly interpreted negatively. Yeah. It's possible to be meaning well and incorrectly be interpreted. Uh, and it does beg the question, um, so do we choose inaction always or, you know, with the presumption of inaction is safer, right? So that I'll just keep, I, I won't do the thing that could potentially be offensive. Um, and I, I don't have an answer for that yet. Uh, I'm working through it and, you know, the... You know what? I have an answer. Yes. I will always engage. I will um, always engage, and here's why. Let me give you another example, and this is more Black Lives Matter than it is the Me Too movement. So uh, Joe and I and the company and 20 other businesses in Milwaukee gathered around Dr. Driver when she was a superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools, and we launched a two-year culinary arts program. in four, We piloted it in four high schools, and one of the high schools was Vincent, which is in the far northwest corner of the city. It is a campus that on any given day can have in somewhere between 1,500 to upwards people there, right? Um, and my job was to go in and help the kids learn how to cook. There were days when I was the only Caucasian person on the campus, okay? Now, in this city, I could have gone in there and showed up with all this armor on, right? Fear, armor, right? I'm afraid. Every single school that I went into, you had to walk through a metal detector and go past security to get in the school. That could be intimidating for a lot of people in this city, right? And I said to myself, 
is I was walking in on the very first day that we launched the program. I said, be yourself. Be you. And I walk in and there's a kid already on the corner who's already, he's waiting for a ride. Now, why he's on the corner, I have no idea, right? I don't know if he decided he was sick. I don't know if he did something to cause him to have to go home that day. But his body language was very withdrawn and very protective. And I looked at him and I said, hey, man, how are you? I said, I'm all right. I said, how are you? I said, man, I'm great. I woke up today. And he looked at me and went, huh, thanks. And I continued to walk in the school. And I spent, I don't even know how many hours, but for, for four years, I did this on Tuesdays and Thursdays, essentially, at four MPS high schools working with kids, right? I was always myself, Elmer. I showed up with a smile on my face. I look to make eye contact. If I get eye contact, I am going to talk to you. It drives my brothers crazy. If you make eye contact with me, and sometimes even if you don't, I am going to try to connect with you. I'm going to bring the best that I have, and I'm going to show you that I see you, and that in that moment when we're passing, you matter to me. And I don't think I'm going to go wrong. And you know what? If I do, I hope that the people that know me well call me out. So I got to tell you, um, I won't suggest that what you just offered is, uh, is truthful, but it's not, it's not always applicable to everyone. No. And I'll tell you, I mean... The ability to be yourself um, is just not available. You know, so listen, I, I am, um, you know, according to the data, right, I am an example of uh, a successful American. And that's without consideration to any of my, my demographic information. However, um, I don't necessarily get to just uh, be myself in, in, every, in, in every environment because I'm encumbered by preloaded ideas as soon as, I, in, as soon as the idea of me enters the room, right? Because sometimes it's not me physically walking in and people seeing me. It's, it's people understanding that they're about to interact with uh, a black man of a certain age, of a certain background, and from a certain place. And so uh, my, my most genuine, natural, in-the-moment self can be perceived as threatening. And so I have to make choices that, while not um, contrary to myself are not an, uh, not my most natural self. I'll give you a super light example. Last week I went camping. So we talked about being in nature. Yep. So last week I was extreme green, right? Um, like Andy said, I was super green. Uh, and my mother-in-law, my mother, my wife, and many others were very concerned because I was going away for four days by myself into the far off hinterlands of, of Wisconsin. And remember, I'm not from here and nor is my family. So their perception of what the wilds of Wisconsin could be are probably different from the reality. So while I'm in these campsites and I've driven by uh, political signs <laughs> of every type. Um, I make choices to present myself because I'm by myself um, in a safer way. For instance, oftentimes I wore a blaze orange hunting cap. Now, I wore the blaze orange hunting cap at least a little bit so that uh, if I was near hunting grounds, I would be visible. <coughs> 
It was really more so that I could be wearing something familiar to uh, others who might not necessarily, not, it's not that they had anything against me being there, but they might not be entirely comfortable having seen someone like me in an environment where they're not used to that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the kind of uh, ways that sometimes we can't just be ourselves. So let me ask you a question. Remember the moment that we met? Um, yes. Were you yourself? Um, this is, a, this is a, a great challenge. Was I myself? Well, I'll tell you. When we met, I was, I was at work. Mm -hmm. And so I was my work self. How's that different from your non-work self? Um, my work self, and I'm, I'm pretty fortunate that I get to do work that is very well aligned with, my, with much of my personal agenda, right? I get to do work that is about making this place where I live uh, more prosperous. Uh, but I don't necessarily get to represent all of my ideas. I don't necessarily get to be public about the places where I, I um, am passionately in disagreement with what's happening. So maybe <laughs> is my answer. Okay. Now, I will say this. I will say this. In a lot of ways, you and I, as we were sitting next to each other, we had a little bubble around us. And in that little bubble, I could be much more of Elmer than I could be in the larger bubble that was the room. So maybe also was that I don't distinguish between different selves. What you see here is what you would get if you hired me to work with your staff on what I'm working with. My behavior um, is always consistent and I always show up with an open heart and an open mind. And so I wonder if our exchange and given the Me Too movement, I mean, you sat, you know, you came in. So for those of you that weren't there, he, he slid into the room and took like the last seat. I'm not gonna say he was late, but maybe he was close to being right on time. So he slides in and he sits now next to me and we automatically have this connection, right? I think, I absolutely hear you, but you know, I've sat in rooms, I don't know what, I, I'm not speaking about Black Lives Matter movement, I'm speaking about the Me Too movement. I've sat in rooms and gone places where I was the only female, a lot, a lot. And unlike the Black Lives Matter movement and your need to um, show up differently because of your personal safety, right? That's not gonna happen in a corporate boardroom. It's not, right? I might feel emotionally um, unsafe, but I'm not gonna feel physically unsafe in that environment. So it's not the same thing, I hear you. But I've sat at many tables where I was the only female and I, I find that things go better for me. And, I can, and what that means is that I connect, right? This world is all about us connecting. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we are all connected. So when I have the opportunity to be with a human being, I want to connect with you. I believe that I have something to learn from you. But the only way that that's, that magic is gonna happen, that serendipitous moment that you and I had is gonna happen, is if I show up with an open heart and an open mind and a genuine willingness to connect. No matter who I'm in front of. And so I, I hear you, there are things that I wouldn't talk about at work, right? I have an opinion that's strong. Uh, you know, I, I, um, 
I've decided that I don't ever want to sit on the leadership team of another nonprofit because I, I see things differently than people and, and I can be provoking and that's not always productive. So, so, you know, our audience is, is oftentimes business owners. And in fact, even some of the names I'm seeing in the chat, I, I know folks are business owners or starting startup business owners. So I'm going to ask you, how do you navigate that in the space of, you know, growing and protecting your business? That, that issue of here's all of what I think versus uh, the, the challenge of presenting to customers, presenting to employees, prospective employees, and the rest. How do you navigate that? I'll give you a great example of that, right? Um, we, Joe, had 17 restaurants in the greater Milwaukee area. We were regularly called on to support political candidates. Mm -hmm. And um, while we knew who we were, the public saw us as Switzerland. We never ever talked about who we voted for, how we voted. We just talked about that we voted, right? It's important to vote. We talked about that we voted. We didn't support anybody. So I, I think there are just certainly topics that you need to stay away from in, in a business environment for sure, right? Um, but I don't believe that that means that there can't be productive discourse around how people see and, and feel things. I, I as an example, um, I was in a meeting uh, last week. I sit on a couple of boards mm -hmm. and I was in a meeting last week with a company and they were doing a, uh, a marketing promotion. And uh, the marketing promotion happened to be uh, tools that guys would use typically, right? You know, Joe loved to go to Home Depot. Yes, there are plenty of women who geek, geek about Home Depot, but typically more, if you, had, if you looked at this set of things, you would say geared more towards male audience than a female audience, right? It would be an easy conclusion to make. So I asked the question, who's the audience? What percentage of the demographic is male and what percentage of the demographic is female? And they said, we don't know, but we can get back to you on that. And I said, I, I'm just curious. And I said, listen, I said, this isn't about anything other than my observation because my perspective is different than yours. Um, there were, there were, it was 90% women, uh, men on the call and 10% women on the call. And I said, my perspective is different. I said, if you have a demographic that is largely male, I think this is perfect. If you have a demographic that isn't largely male, you might, you might want to reconsider or you might want to consider this in the future, right? I'm provoking, right? Mm -hmm. I can be a pain in the, I'm not going to swear on you know, this, but I can be a pain in the rear, right? But I see my job, I love people. I lift people, I support people, I thrive off of being connected to other people. But I also feel I have a responsibility to share what I see, knowing full well that that can be provoking. I've, I've definitely learned to be more diplomatic about how I communicate these things. And now I do it through questions as opposed to statements. No one likes to be told anything, right? So I find it's better to ask questions than to make a statement about something. So who's, so in this particular case around these tools, I said, well, who's the audience? So as opposed to me saying, wow, this seems like it's geared towards a male audience, you forgot about the women, which isn't what I was thinking, but it's how another statement could have been interpreted. Mm -hmm. I've learned to just ask the question, well, who's the demographic? So first, I, I, I want to address a couple points in the Q&A. Uh, and, and then I'm going to, just recognizing the time, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you to, to do what you do really well. But give me a second. Brother. So first, we've got two folks who have asked, uh, in the training that you did, was racial trauma part of the discourse? 
uh, in the training that I did with my first company, no. Um, in the training that I do now, it is, um, not in the session that I currently offer, but it is part of a global thing, right? So there's race, there's gender, there's your sexual orientation, right? It, it is all, all of those things that make us unique and special that make our life experience unique to us, particular to us. So yes, but it's not a deep dive as if you are doing the formal trauma-informed care with St. A, there is a very large section on it. So, thank you. So like I said, you know, we, we, we exist, Scale Up, to uh, transform, we say we transform the culture of growth in Milwaukee. And we do that to generate and to foster economic prosperity for everyone. And we sort of at our core believe that uh, that culture of growth, which quietly we believe growth, we believe in the growth mindset. So we're not just talking about entrepreneurial or economic growth, but we're actually talking about the idea that people can learn, that people can uh, discover new abilities and so on. So with that being our magnetic idea, we have created an audience of folks who are um, intentionally or unintentionally attracted to that possibility. So I'm, I'm, I'm describing to you the, what we believe is the zeitgeist of our audience and, and who we are speaking to. With that in mind, in the context of, uh, it's hard to describe this year without using curse words, so I won't. Um, in, in, this, in this moment that we're experiencing, with consideration to um, everything, just everything that is making it difficult to wake up feeling green. What do you want people to know so that they can uh, thoughtfully, meaningfully, um, and, and more important, positively, enable the growth and the opportunity that, that we're seeking? It's a great question. Um, I, think, I think leadership um, is much like parenting. I think when you choose to be a leader um, and whether or not you want to accept that responsibility because you started a company, like you could be the tinker in the backyard who comes up with this great idea and you have no desire to have a company, but all of a sudden you've got a company, right? Some of us are just better suited to be leaders and, and some of us struggle at leading people uh, a little bit more. But when you choose to be a leader and that's the position that you find yourself in, you owe it to yourself first, just like a parent to, to be as whole as you possibly can be to get yourself to a place where you feel like your foundation is solid. Because people look to the leader. We always are gonna default to what the leader does. Mm -hmm. You know, we were taught, I, I'm sure most of us were taught, if you don't know what to do when you go to somebody's house and they invited you over for dinner, just watch everybody else first, right? Like see how it goes first. We, our default is to look to our leaders and so, it's hard as a leader to lead, and it's really hard to show up every day with a strong foundation, which is why I think as scary as it is, if we can be vulnerable as leaders and we can say, hey, I'm a yellow today, guys. I'm a red today. That then creates a place, and it doesn't have to be my words, right? I can, it could be one, two, three. It could be whatever you want to use within your company to be able to communicate so that you have an understanding. But when you're seen as being vulnerable as a leader, you establish trust, right? No one's perfect. We were created to make mistakes. We were. And if you don't believe in, in a higher being, we are, we're human and we make mistakes all the time. It's how we deal with that that matters. And so if you're off your foundation and you go into work and you think you're gonna fake it, 
we sniff it out. 93% of how we communicate is with our bodies. This is neuroscience. I'm not making it up. You can't fake it all day. No matter how hard you try, if your foundation isn't solid, you can't fake it all day. So then what happens is if you don't say, I'm having a rough day, guys, ladies, gentlemen, people, then what happens is your body language is going to say something to me that doesn't match what you're saying out of your mouth verbally. Now I'm confused. Did I do something wrong? Am I in trouble? Am I about to lose my job? Is the company about to close? Because these are the things that the people underneath the leaders think. As leaders, we want to say to our employees, look, if I have a problem with you, I'm going to come to you and we're going to talk about it. And we're going to work through it. And no matter how many times you say that to somebody, if that's, in if that's the leader that you are, they're not going to hear you because you're the boss. Joe never understood. His first tenant of operations was taking care of his employees and Joe never understood why anybody would be intimidated by him. Because we're the employees and you're the boss. Mm -hmm. So if as the boss, you try to show up and pretend that you are not suffering challenges mentally because of COVID or because of your awareness of the racial injustice that surrounds us on a daily basis, if you don't acknowledge those things, then you're never going to be in a relationship with your employees. And I can promise you, after helping my husband build a very large company, if you are not in a relationship with your employees, your engine isn't working the way that it could. Your employees have to trust that you're a human being, that you have feelings, that you are tired, that the person that cut you off in traffic did bother you. If you want your employees to go to war with you every day, the war that is your company and fighting to continue to hold the company together and boost sales, they need to know that you're a human being that sees them and hears them and has the very same struggles that they do. So if you go to work and think you have to be this perfect person, no one's gonna follow you. The greatest cost to a business, two things. Joe said an empty seat. I would always say turnover, which is what I got from Fortune 500 America. The single greatest cost to a company is turnover. If you don't want turnover and you want your engine cranking on all of its, all of its cylinders, please, as leaders, Find a way to tap into a place that allows you to be courageous and a human being at work. We're human beings having this human existence. Otherwise, you look like you're a human doing and you're partly checked out. Jennifer, I am um, so excited that the first time that we have been able to spend a lot of time together is in this moment and we recorded it for for everyone to see and for everyone to know about forever and ever before i close this down i just want to make sure we have one moment if anyone had comments or questions that they wanted to add into the q a um, and jen i'm going to ask you while i give them two seconds to do that think about uh, something that you'd like to recommend that we all read and or listen to. Actually, I'll give you three options. Read, listen to, or watch. And it can be any, anything you feel like recommending. Uh, and we'll obviously share a link to it. Um, so with no comments in the q and I just want to say thank you to everyone who logged in. Thank you to everyone that's watching this live and who will watch this recorded. Um, we are so proud to offer the opportunity for a conversation with Jennifer Bartolotta, who is so many things. Her, her title belies her impact and her capacity, but right now she is spending a lot of her time being the CEO and the founder of Bartolotta and Associates. I hope for your sake, you have the opportunity to 
not just run into her on the street, but be run into her on the street. So she can give you a moment to transition from whatever color you want to super green. So Jen, as we, as we shut it down, I'm gonna invite you to make a recommendation for something to read, watch, or listen to, and, and say whatever you'd like. I would, I would uh, one of my favorite things is Dan Harris's uh, podcast called 10% Happier. It started um, based on uh, meditation and, and he interviews from rock stars to the Dalai Lama and everyone in between, but he has pivoted that and the conversation is a lot around um, what's happening to us right now, both from a, a racial equity perspective as well as a mental health perspective. So it's not as meditation focused right now, although that's a key component of it. Mm -hmm. And there's something for everybody. The, 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 the people that he has interviewed on this is amazing. And if you go and check it out, you, I promise you, you'll find somebody you wanna to listen to. Love it, 10% Happier. Dan Harris's podcast, which is the follow-up to his great book. Jen, have an incredible super green day. I'm excited to talk to you and see you again soon. Thanks, Elmer. I'll end as I end everything. May the love and light in me shine upon and welcome the love and light in each and every one of you. I love that. We'll see you soon. <laughs>